So our next speaker is David Kingley, Network Dynamics of the Basal Forebrain and Parietal Cortex. Right. <clears throat> all right, so this morning we all accomplished something pretty incredible, and we probably all took that for granted. Um, what that is, it's just a simple task, starting on the outside of this door, walking in and sitting down somewhere. So if we analyze what actually goes into that process, this morning when I walked in through this door, I started outside, I looked at and attended to the doorknob, then I planned and executed the motor actions necessary to turn the doorknob and open the door. And at that moment, I shifted my attention away from the doorknob into the room, and I started surveying what was going on in the room. After surveying the room for a second, I noticed an open seat, and I focused on that seat as I walked towards it. I began to ignore other things in the environment. <coughs> so what's really cool about this is that we are able to shift our attention in intelligent ways in order to function in everyday life. Um, and I'm very interested in the brain mechanisms behind these shifts in attention. So two brain regions that have been implicated as very important for different types of attention are the basal forebrain and the parietal cortex. <coughs> So now we have brain regions that we might want to study, and we have this attentional shift that we want to study. Um, the next thing we have to do is come up with a task where a rat is accomplishing these shifts in attention so that we can study these brain regions. Um, so in this selective attention task, we have an arena that's depicted by this cartoon over here. The diameter of this outside circle is actually a four-foot arena. And in the middle, there's a center plate where the rat is trained to stay on the center plate. All along <coughs> the perimeter, there are lights that can be flashed. Um, whatever, there are lights that can be flashed. So the rat is trained to stay on the center plate and wait for a light flash. When he sees one, he's trained to run out, poke his nose in a hole, turn around, and come back to the center plate. If he pokes the correct hole, he gets a cheerio. So. What's important about this task is that there are different phases where he's paying attention to different things. So there's the waiting phase where he's on the plate and he's looking out in the environment and he's waiting for a stimulus. He's waiting for that light flash, but he doesn't know where it's going to come from. Then once he sees the light flash, he has to switch and lock on to just that light flash and run out to where it was. After he's nose poked, he also has to turn around and return to the plate and the plate's actually elevated, so as he's coming back, he has to attend to his jump up to make sure he doesn't trip and fall or something else. Um, and then obviously he has to search for a reward. <clears throat> Alright, so now that we have this task where the rat is shifting his attention, uh, we're going to get into some anatomy. The two brain regions that we want to study in relation to this task are the parietal cortex and the basal forebrain. So Jeremiah just got done talking a little bit about the parietal cortex. We'll skip over and discuss the basal forebrain to start. So a few interesting features about the basal forebrain. Uh, the first is that it is projecting to a variety of different cortical regions. And that's depicted here with the multicolored arrows. So it has the ability to influence a variety of different regions. Um, it also receives input from the prefrontal cortex, the picture here is this black arrow, and a variety of other cortical regions. Um, these two things in combination with the, uh, the population of basal forebrain neurons is very heterogeneous. So it's actually made up of neurons of different types. So what that means is that, that there are neurons in the basal forebrain that correspond to different neurotransmitters. That's depicted here as blue, green, and pink, which are GABAergic, glutamatergic, and cholinergic neurons. <coughs> so quite a bit is known about the anatomy of the basal forebrain. However, not very much is known about how it's functioning. Um, one of the things we don't really know is what time scale is it operating on. Is it influencing these cortical regions on the millisecond scale, the second scale, or maybe over tens of seconds? Um, Previous uh, studies looking at uh, previous studies looking at Alzheimer's has shown that there's a degeneration of basal forebrain neurons. Lesion studies have shown that it's incredibly important for incrementing attention, but we don't know why it's important, and we don't know how it's influencing these other structures that it's connected to. Um, 
Um, some other previous work has shown that firing activity in the basal forebrain, so the neurons in this region, um, fire action potentials to relevant stimuli such as a light flash or a sound and to a reward, <coughs> such as a cheerio, um, in the case of many of these tasks. So this firing activity isn't necessarily unique. There are a lot of brain regions that respond to a stimulus and respond to a reward. And the anatomy of the basal forebrain, the way it's connected with other brain regions, would suggest that it's capable of much more complex firing patterns. <coughs> All right, so the last thing before we jump into some of the data, um, we have recorded and processed quite a few neurons in both of these brain regions. How do we look at all the data while avoiding information overload? <coughs> um, one of the ways we can do this, there are a variety of machine learning algorithms. If you are not familiar with these terms, that's okay. Um, essentially what they do is they group similar patterns while separating out different patterns. So if we apply this to all of the neurons that we've recorded. What that will do is it allows us to pull out, pull out neurons with similar firing patterns and differentiate between different patterns. That will be shown a little bit easier here. So what this heat map represents is 10 neurons. It's the average firing rate of each neuron across the task. So each row here represents a single neuron, and it represents the average firing rate on this task. So the rat's waiting for the light, he sees the light, he takes off at this green arrow, he runs out and he knows pokes at this orange arrow, turns around and comes back to the plate at the purple arrow. Those same arrows are depicted here, just to give you an idea of the different phases of the task. So these first 10 neurons, we see a similar firing pattern across all of them in that they're firing when the rat is running out to where he's going to nose poke, and then they fire again once he's gotten back to the center plate and gotten his cheerio. We see a different eight neurons down here, again, eight rows, one row for each neuron, where they're firing just after the rat has nose poked, and again, just after he's returned to the plate. Down here, we just see a plot of the averages of these two groups. So the red line represents these eight neurons, the blue line represents the average of these 10 neurons. <coughs> So to study a brain region, we can't just look at a few cells and say, you know, the whole region is doing this based on a few cells. We have to look at the network as a whole and see what all of these different neurons are doing together. That's what I've attempted to do with this figure here. So we're going to start with this figure up on the upper left. So this represents 25 neurons. Again, the arrows represent the different phases of the task. And across the task, these neurons are all doing something similar. So when the rat is running out, he's seen the light, and he's running to the nose poke, they decrease their activity. After he's made his nose poke and he's returning to the plate, there's a slight increase, might be kind of hard to see in the back, there's a slight increase in firing activity. And then after he's crossed over onto the center plate, there's a, yet again another decrease in activity that's hard to see if you're in the back. It might be a little bit easier to see is this blue line down here, which is the average. So, Converse to that, we have 31 neurons here that seem to be doing the opposite. So in the time when he's running out, they're increasing their firing rate, and then they decrease when he's running back to the center plate, and then they increase again when he's getting a reward. <coughs> so for now, I'll call this an alternating pattern, because over the phases of the task, these neurons are alternating between excitation and inhibition. These two center groups, we see a similar relationship where we have groups of neurons, 32 here and 19 here, that are doing opposite things, but they're doing it at different phases of the task. So you might look at these and say, okay, well, you know, at this first phase where he's running out, they are doing something similar, but by the end of the task, they're doing something very different. So they're actually alternating four times instead of three times. Finally, we have groups of neurons in the basal forebrain that seem to be maintaining their activity over the entire time that the rat, over the phases of the task where the rat is running out and back to the center plate. So here we have neurons that are decreasing their activity. Here we have neurons that are increasing their activity. Now, it's important to take all of this in at once because the basal forebrain, through its different neuron, or 
through its different types of neurons and through its different connections, maybe doing different things in different brain regions. Here we see a very complex pattern across the entire network of the basal forebrain. All right, so jumping to the parietal cortex. A few things that Jeremiah mentioned. Um, the parietal cortex receives input from a variety of different regions. One of those regions is the basal forebrain, depicted here with these arrows. Um, decades of research have shown that it's incredibly important for spatial attention, and more recent research has shown that the parietal cortex is capable of mapping around space. <clears throat> so with these things in mind, the first question I wanted to ask is, are there any similarities between firing patterns in the basal forebrain and firing patterns in the parietal cortex? Remember that there is this connectivity between the two regions, so we may expect to see some similar patterns. And we do. So remember, this is a figure you've already seen of the alternating firing pattern we see in the basal forebrain. In the parietal cortex, we have another eight cells that seem to be doing a very similar pattern. So if you compare this blue line here to this blue line here, you'll see that there's something very similar going on in two different brain regions. <coughs> Digging a little deeper, we see something, again, similar between the maintaining category in the basal forebrain and the maintaining cells in the parietal cortex. <coughs> All right, so this would, uh, this would suggest that there are different cognitive processes associated with the task that the ride is doing that are shared across at least these two brain regions, if not others as well. Um, with this in mind, again, we've, we've found some similarities. Now we want to look for differences between firing patterns. These brain regions, actually I don't have it. Uh, if you remember back to the anatomy slide, they receive input from very different regions, and they have a different population of neurons. So we may expect some differences. And that's where we see something that happens in the parietal cortex that does not seem to be happening in the basal forebrain. And that is some type of anticipation prior to the light flash. So this time period highlighted in red is prior to when the rat has even seen the light. He's waiting at the center plate and he knows that somewhere in the environment the light is going to flash. With that in mind, we see neurons in the parietal cortex that are greatly increasing their firing activity even though the rat <coughs> isn't necessarily running through the task. He's waiting for the light. So if we zoom in on this area right here and compare it to the basal forebrain, so that's simply all we've done is we've blown up this blue line as the 14 parietal cells that I just showed you, um, and we compare it to the entire population of basal forebrain neurons. So in the basal forebrain, if we take all 1,200 neurons that we recorded and processed, we see a slight decrease over this time period before the light has been flashed. Conversely to that, we see these 14 parietal cells have a drastic increase in firing activity. <coughs> All right, so, so far I've shown you a variety of different firing patterns, uh, cells that seem to be alternating through phases of the task, cells that seem to be maintaining their firing pattern across phases of the task. Um, and what we want to get back to is that this is really an attentional sequence. The rat is shifting his attention throughout these phases of the task. So how can we examine the different phases of the task together with these different categories? That's what I've attempted to do here. So we have five different categories of neurons. And these black dots represent the color of the line that will appear down here that represents their average. So we have 14 neurons depicted here in black that seem to be increasing their firing pattern prior to the light flash. And then if we look at this green category, we see neurons that are responding and firing action potentials when the rat is running out to the nose poke. And if we keep going with this pink group, we see that there are neurons that are responding when the rat is turning around and returning to the center plate. And we can keep going with this. We see these <coughs> blue, this blue category responding just before and during the phase of the task when the rat is jumping up onto the center plate. <clears throat> and then this final red category, we see these neurons are responding to the rat getting material. So these are parietal cortex neurons, but keep in mind that we can do something similar to this with the basal forebrain. Um, it gets messy because there are a lot more basal forebrain neurons, 
So it's not quite as distinct. Um, something else to keep in mind. Without the categorization, so without separating these into different groups, it just looks like a mess. You have a jumble of cells, and when you take the average of it, it just looks like a bunch of squiggles. So here we can see that there are neurons that are doing something different at different phases of the task, and that's because of the way it's been categorized. <coughs> All right, so a few things to take away from this. Uh, the first would be that the basal forebrain has extremely complicated firing activity that's related to the phases of this task, and that it's more complicated than what has been previously shown in other research. Um, also, the parietal cortex neurons seem to show similar and different patterns relative to the basal forebrain. And together, these regions, uh, they have the necessary network dynamics to carry out these sequential shifts in attention. So, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, these sequential shifts in attention that accompany performance on a task with multiple phases. Um, the last thing I would like to mention is that this research takes a very long time and it takes a lot of people a very long time. So these are just a few of the people that have contributed to this project. Um, hundreds if not thousands of work hours. So. I'd like to thank the NITS lab and everyone in it for helping out. <coughs>